Okay, so let's talk a little bit about a animals and what they're able to communicate and how we know what they can communicate. You might wonder why are we going to talk about animal language. Um, we all know that our dogs give off body language and our cats and stuff and that you know bees can communicate with pheromones and I mean we know that they can give messages to each other. We know that our dog can understand things that we say to them, at least certain things, like they know their own name, they know come, sit, stay, you know, they know certain words. So it's clear that other animals have some language capability. But where the, what the question is really about is whether language is something that makes humans unique among the rest of the animals. Um, we've for a long time, you know, tried to, ever since the, um, you know, Darwin asserted that humans are evolved from animals. Humans have been really trying to find the thing that makes us different to really point to, to say, well, we're not just animals, we're animals with this other skill. Um, the thing that makes it um, animal language interesting to, to psychologists is that it gives us a little bit of a window into their minds, right? What do they know? What do they understand? How intelligent are they? So animal language serves a lot of different purposes. One of the things that makes animal language different from other languages is that in all the different languages, all the different abilities for animals to communicate, none of them can do what we can do with language, which is talk about the future, you know, make plans, things like that, um, reflect on the past, discuss, you know, I don't think dogs lay around in their pack discussing, remember that one time when you were a puppy and, you know, you thought that, that uh, you know, the beta female was actually a stranger and you barked out of that was funny. That was really funny. I mean, they don't, they don't have that kind of reflective capability with their language. I mean, I don't know if they can think about stuff like that, but they can't express it through body language and stuff. So one thing that makes us different is our ability to talk about things that aren't just right now, right here. Um, you know, in the um, present. So let's get into it. What do we know about animals? Well, in order to figure out whether animals can learn a language and understand grammatical structures and things like that, a lot of researchers have attempted to teach language to animals. And so Kanzi, the bonobo monkey, is a good example. Um, Yes, he's wearing a sweatshirt and nothing else. I don't know what's up with that get up. But Kanzi was really interesting because his mom was recruited into this uh, animal language study at Emory University when Kanzi was a baby. So obviously mom was a fully developed adult bonobo monkey at the time. But she was a good mom, so she took her baby to work with her, and Kanzi would sit on her lap or cling to her to her fur while she was being taught this series of lexigrams. You see the lexigrams in the picture with Kanzi. They're different shapes, kind of like you could think of them being like the pictograms that you see in Egyptian hieroglyphs, right? Um, each icon means something to um, to the monkey is the is the idea. We're going to teach the monkey an association between this lexigram and or, the you know eating an orange. You know having an orange to eat. Um, this lex lexigram means let's go play. This lexigram means throw the ball. Things like that. Um, Kanzi's mom Muliki never learned very many lexigrams. She got a very um, rudimentary you know couple handfuls worth of of lexigrams that she could communicate with. Very simple things too, things that were like things she wanted. Food, play, water, things like that. Um, she had a, a lexigram for Kanzi and that was about it. She didn't, really didn't, she never combined two lexigrams together and she never really got fluent with receptive language. Like the, the um, humans would talk to her and she didn't ever really fully understand what they were saying. Um, she would get like maybe one word in isolation. Kanzi, who was never directly being taught the lexigrams, Maliki was being taught using Skinnerian reward principles, where when she learned a, a lexigram, she got a reward. Um, Kanzi was just there and observing the dialogue between the humans and his mom, and he, just through observation alone, learned more lexigrams than his mom ever did. And so what Kanzi really showed the researchers is that there, there's a critical period 
of infancy when you can teach a language to any animal, any baby. Um, us humans learn best when we're youngest and um, obviously Maliki, the mom, had been past the critical period and that's why she was so limited in her ability to learn the lexigrams. Kanzi has a, a, a repertoire of somewhere around a thousand maybe 2,000 lexigrams that he knows. He can communicate at the telegraphic speech level, so he's kind of like a two-year-old in his ability to produce language using the lexigrams. What's interesting is that he uh, definitely has more elaborate receptive language. The trainers can tell him, you know, um, they put a mask over their faces so that they, they can't inadvertently look at what they're talking about or give him other cues. He has to rely on the spoken language. And he can say things like, you know, pour the coke into the bowl. Um, you know, get the pine branches and put it in the ref in the refrigerator. I mean, crazy instructions that are not normal that they've made up on the fly. And he understands and does what he's told. So it implies that he understands um, way more than he can produce, and he can produce at the level of of like a toddler. Um, oh, now that I look at him more closely, I think he has a shirt and a jacket on, and that's it. So that's Kanzi. Okay. Alex the gray parrot, oddly enough, is a gray parrot. Um, parrots are interesting because uh, they can talk back in a language we understand. So Alex didn't need to be taught a series of lexigrams. He, he needed to be taught a, a, you know, a set of words. Um, and apparently it took years to teach him the words that they, that they needed him to know in order to test what he understands. Their intention with, with Alex was to figure out um, bird intelligence, what, what birds can understand and things like that. So they spent a long time teaching him words like keys and metal and plastic and wood and shape and just all these different things. They spent a long time teaching him the words that he needed. Once he had a decent vocabulary that they could understand, then they would ask him questions like what you're seeing in this picture. They're showing him two keys, obviously. And then they ask him a question like, what's the same? And that question is designed to prompt Alex to look for what these two things have in common. And so he might say shape. Um, or they might ask him what's different. And he could say size, right? One's bigger than the other. He could say matter which is the word that they taught him to um, represent what it's made of. He could say color. You know, there are a lot of things he could focus on. And um, what they found is that um, Alex has the ability to categorize things, organize things based on similarities and differences. He triggers on things like size, color, shape. Um, and that kind of makes sense. I mean, if you th think about what birds do in the wild, they have to categorize things into food, not food, you know, predator, not predator, um, you know, safe, not safe, you know, things like that. So it kind of makes sense that he can do it with any object. He just needs to be taught what the categories are so he can express it to them. So Alex was cool because he could actually, you know, we could understand him, which made him a little easier to, to show to other people, not the researchers themselves, but to, to show um, to other people that he, he does understand these concepts. Unfortunately, Alex was supposed to have lived another like 60 years. Gray parrots live like 90 or 100 years. And he was only about 30 years old. And they found him dead in his cage and they're not sure what got him. So um, that was a very sad day in the field of animal language research. Um, they, they put a lot of energy into him, but they really loved him. He was so cute. You know, they would leave the room and he'd go, bye-bye, be good, I love you. And you know, how sad is that as you're walking out and having to leave him overnight? Um, he was just such a little sweetie pie. And, and you know, you got that kind of feedback from a, from a great parrot. Dolphins have the um, limitations of not having fingers like the bonobo has and can't speak like a gray parrot. Yet through clever research, they've been able to figure out what um, dolphins know and understand by teaching them using sign language. And it's not ASL or any formalized sign language. They've taught the dolphins a series of gestures that mean ball, go get, um, you know, things, very simple things that can be done in the pool. And using that set of um, gestures that they've made up, they can give dolphins a series of steps to complete. You know, go touch the football with your flipper, go balance the um, basketball on your nose, and bring me back the, you know, inflatable barbell. And the dolphin can do all of them. 
So uh, research with animal language in dolphins has really re revealed the complexity of what dolphins can do and understand. They can categorize. Um, they're really uh, trainable also. They, they really um, make associations quickly. So like the military uses dolphins to go locate mines that have been placed underwater. They don't go detonate them. The dolphins are taught just to, um, they have a little inflatable ball that they strap to the dolphin's back. And then when the dolphin finds a mine, he actually clamps down on the, on the little press, pressure release and it causes the little um, marker to go up and balance on the surface of the water above where the mine is. And um, they're taught that really easily. Their dolphins are really easy to train, probably because they understand our intent so well, which is part of language. Okay, now I mentioned we train, you know, you can train dolphins with gestures. Um, you know, there's a big debate, believe it or not, in the field of linguistics, trying to figure out which came first, gestured languages for humans or spoken languages. Um, one theory is that lang spoken languages came first and that they emerged out of moms communicating with their babies in a series of coos and calls and stuff like that that evolved into sort of sanctified words. Um, the other theory is that humans have a need to communicate and whether they do it orally out their mouths or they do it with their hands, either way um, that, that need to communicate will come out and that gestures came before our vocal tract had evolved into the position that would allow us to talk. I don't know. It's hard to say because, you know, we have to, we have to guess whether Neanderthals were gesturing or, if, or, or could speak, you know, these kinds of things. We have to kind of guess and infer. Um, one thing that I know is that humans who can speak generally accompany that speech with gestures. And uh, so a lot of research has focused on what is the function of a gesture. Now here we have uh, a couple of chimpanzees in this drawing um, who have spotted a antelope. And they're doing universal gestures that humans use, you know, wait, hey, what's that? You know, pointing and waiting, those are signs that we see, those are gestures that we see in the very youngest humans, you know, toddlers who haven't learned to speak yet will point at things, um, stuff like that. So gestures seem to be pretty basic and probably go back really far, which provides further evidence that probably um, gestural language came first. But here's where it gets really interesting. We gesture not always to convey meaning to the listener. Um, obviously the chimpanzees are trying to convey messages to each other. He, the guy on the phone, sorry about the old timey phone, right? Look at that, he's got a cord on his phone. What is that? Um, although my office phone has a cord on it, so I guess it's okay. Um, so he's on the phone. Obviously the listener can't hear him. Or, no, <laughs> you can't see him, sorry. Just trying to see if you're really paying attention to this lecture. So the listener can't see him, yet he's making gestures with his hands while he talks. And you might notice this about yourself, that when you're talking on the phone or you're talking to somebody who can't see you, you'll still make the gestures. Um, and the gestures aren't necessarily straightforward communication things like wait here gestures or look at that gestures, but instead uh, there's a lot of like hand waving in a circle like when you're searching for a word, you'll make that little wheel shape in the air while you're like, what's that word? Um, those kinds of gestures. Why do we do that? Well, research has shown that if you prevent a person from um, freely moving their hands while they're trying to think of an elusive word, they will have a harder time thinking of the word than if you let them freely gesture. So that kind of implies that gesturing actually helps the speaker to speak more fluently, to have greater access to the words that they intend to use. Um, so gesturing is not really an aid for the listener, it's an aid for the speaker. Um, I think I mentioned in an earlier uh, lecture that I try absolutely not to, to gesture while I'm making these lectures so that I'll slow down. It's as a listener with, you can't see me, we don't really have any context and stuff, so it's harder to understand what I'm saying if I blur words together or speak too quickly. So I, I consciously limit my hand gestures. I hold something in my hand. Sometimes I literally sit on my hands and it slows me down so that you guys have a better chance of being able to understand what I'm talking about. Um, gestures give us too much fluency and so if I do too many gestures, all of a sudden I'll get on a roll. And you might notice sometimes I speed up 
and a lot of times that's when my hands have escaped and I start getting on a roll and the gestures are helping me to, to be too fluent. Um, so they benefit the speaker more than the listener. Okay, now my final comment on animal language is uh, some people have criticized the attempts to understand what an animal is thinking by teaching them a language because it's possible that we are just projecting wants and desires and beliefs or whatever onto the animals and the animals really aren't conveying that message. Um, here we have a chimpanzee who's been taught ASL and he's making a sign and the human is interpreting the sign as a standard sign. The thing is the ch that the chimpanzees and the gorillas who have been taught ASL don't deliver ASL quite the way ASL is designed to be delivered. For one thing they don't make the facial um, features that convey a lot of the meaning behind the signs. Um, one of the things, my son took uh, ASL and he's pretty proficient at it, and one of the things that's really super important in ASL is to make facial expressions to help fill in what exactly the sign is that you're gesturing. Also context is really super important. Kind of like when we're talking about telegraphic speech, you have to rely on context. Um, intonation is conveyed by your facial expressions and your body posture. And then of course um, there's there's the sign that you're making but there's also additional gestures. Like if you watch people who are using sign language they'll do like they'll bend their knees in sort of like a yeah sort of joking way while they're while they're telling a joke. It kind of drives home that's their gesture that implies I'm just kidding. Um, things like that. Chimpanzees and, and gorillas who are using ASL don't use that context intonation and gesture to help convey meaning. And so here we have a blank faced chimpanzee making a hug gesture, which might mean he wants to hold the doll, or it might mean something else entirely and we're just interpreting that that's what it means. So we have to be really careful, I mean with the use of the lexigrams, um, we have to be really careful that it's not, that we haven't just taught the, the animal a bunch of associations between this symbol and some outcome and they really don't understand um, at a deeper level that they're conveying their, their thoughts that instead they're just um, producing a behavior and getting reinforced for it. So uh, some people say we got to be a little bit more careful in our excitement over animal language than a lot of researchers are. But I got to say it's pretty exciting when you can communicate with an animal. It is pretty exciting. So all right well I'm going to go ahead and take a break here so we can come back and start fresh in the topic of intelligence. <laughs>